السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبي الرحمة والهدى محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his entire household and all his companions. May Allah bless them and bless every single one of us and grant us all goodness. Beloved brothers and sisters, yesterday we heard how Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was martyred by Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi, a man who had stabbed him whilst he was leading Salatul Fajr. At the time when Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was martyred, he was actually the leader of an area. If we were to put a pencil mark upon it, we would count approximately 35 countries of today. This was the man Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. And it was amazing how Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu had chosen. It is amazing how Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu had chosen a certain group of people. And inshallah, we will come to see this in a few moments in order to select the one who would succeed him. But this evening we will be speaking of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, who happens to be the successor of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. This man was the son of Affan. Affan was one of the leaders of Quraysh. He was a great man, well connected in Quraysh. And he was a person who was so powerful. He was related so deeply to those in Quraysh that Uthman ibn Affan was related to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through his mother and he was related to Abu Sufyan ibn Harb through his father. So his father's cousin was Abu Sufyan and from that he was from the Amawi people, from the Umayyad people. This was Uthman ibn Affan. And from his mother's side he was related to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because his mother, cousin of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness and at least a little bit of knowledge of who Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was. As he was born in a very wealthy home, a very noble home, he was a child who was fair in complexion, very good looking. He was loved by Quraysh as he grew up a toddler and a teenager. They loved him so much, the people of Quraysh. They enjoyed his company so much so that some of the people used to actually say, may Allah love you the way Quraysh used to love Uthman. Obviously, we would not say this because for us, the love of Allah is far higher. But this is only to show you how much they loved Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu as he was young. And when he grew up, subhanallah, he was a person who was wealthy, not only because he was born in a wealthy home, but he became a businessman of note. He was very intelligent. He was very intelligent and he had business dealings that were always very profitable. And he became known as one of the wealthiest of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. But he had certain qualities. You know, if we look today, a wealthy man, very rarely would you find him to be humble and generous. These three qualities to be together in a single person would actually make them worth following. You have a wealthy person, who is humble and generous. Sometimes you have someone who's wealthy, but he's not generous. And sometimes you have someone who's wealthy and generous, but very arrogant. But Uthman ibn Affan was not even arrogant, nor was he a person who was stingy or miserly. He used to spend a lot. And this is something that was unique for him. On top of that, he was a very shy person. So shy that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Uthman is a man whom even the angels are shy of. Amazing. Even the angels are shy of him. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam later on, if he used to be seated and Abu Bakr used to walk in radiallahu anhu, or Umar used to walk in radiallahu anhu, he was still relaxed as he was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the minute Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu walked in, he would sit down and he would actually in fact sit up and he would mend his clothing and make sure that he was seated in a proper position and posture. This was out of the respect he had for Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. Yet he was the father-in-law of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu and we will get to that in a few moments. So this man was wealthy. 
He was a nobleman. He was from Banu Umayyah. His father was the cousin of Abu Sufyan. His mother was the cousin of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was very good looking. He was broad shouldered, which means he was a big man. He was not just a small thin man. He was a big man. He had quite a thick beard. And at the same time, he was loved by Quraysh for his humbleness, humility. He was a very shy and generous person. How did he become a Muslim? Something very interesting. There are several narrations, but all of them confirm that Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu spoke to him. And this was early, before the time that Islam had sought a meeting in the house of Al Arqam. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to meet with some of his companions in the house of Al Arqam ibn Abi Al Arqam radiallahu anhu. Prior to that, Uthman had accepted Islam because Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu spoke to him and told him, Oh Uthman, you are an intelligent man. You are a sharp individual. Don't you know that worshipping these idols is wrong? They do not bring for you any goodness. They cannot protect you from any harm and they cannot harm you as well. So don't you realize and understand that this is all wrong. Do you know that there is a prophet in our midst who has called us to worshipping our maker alone? The one who has made us. Do you know that he has called us towards goodness? He has asked us to leave all the bad habits that our forefathers have been engrossed in and that we have been ingrained within our culture. And Uthman ibn Affan looked at him and says, who is this prophet? He said, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Now, obviously they were related. They were connected because Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was the grandson of Abdul Muttalib, Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib, that was his proper name. So Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn Abdul Muttalib and Uthman ibn Affan's mother, her name was Arwa binti Qurayz. And Qurayz was the daughter of Al Bayda binti Abdul Muttalib, which means they were cousins with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he said, you're trying to tell me that as sadiqul Amin is the one who is now saying he's a prophet. as sadiqul Amin was the title of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the truthful, the trustworthy. So Abu Bakr said, yes, indeed. And at that moment, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was passing. So he greeted Uthman ibn Affan and he tells him, oh Uthman, I am, I am asking you to come forth to worshiping Allah alone. I call you to Islam. I am a messenger of Allah calling you towards worshiping your maker alone. He said, Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I bear witness in what you are calling towards and I bear witness that you are a prophet. No speech, nothing else. Immediately, no questions asked, nothing happened. He just said, I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah and you are indeed a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. As wealthy as he was, as powerful a figure as he was, he was a very influential figure in Quraysh. Although he was slightly younger than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was influential because he had wealth. You know, up to this day, anyone who has a lot of wealth, they are quite influential. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. There was a time we used to say, you know, money talks. Have you heard that? Money talks. But I've actually changed that to money screams. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness and may he make us from those who understand and realize. So he then accepted Islam and he was the first from Banu Hashim, which is the direct clan of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to accept Islam. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so happy, but it made certain people very, very upset. Who became angry? Number one was Al-Hakam ibn Abi al-As. Abu Jahl became very angry. He said, how can a man from our clan accept Muhammad? And this man is from a noble home. This man is from a noble home, Uthman ibn Affan. How can he accept Muhammad ibn Abdullah as a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and quit our ways and our habits? No ways, I'm not going to leave this man. So he started persecuting his own relative. And he told him, I'm not going to leave you, O Uthman, until you leave Muhammad. And Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu says, I will never ever quit Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'm not going to quit my deen. Whatever he is calling towards is correct. It is right. Do not let your position, your power, your authority cloud your understanding of what is right and wrong. So Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, there is an incident that occurred at that particular time. And it was very interesting because 
he married the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that was something that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very happy about. Because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's daughter, Ruqayya binti Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she was engaged to the son of Abu Lahab known as Utbah ibn Abi Lahab. And Abu Lahab was interested in getting this girl into the home because she was known as a very, very good girl brought up by Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was such a good girl in Quraysh that she was known because of her character, nobility, conduct, chastity and so on. But what happened is Abu Lahab decided to go against Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the degree that you know Surat Abu Lahab or Surat Abi Lahab was revealed. Tabbat yada Abi Lahab wa tabba ma aghna anhu malu wa ma kasab sayosla naran that Lahab. That surah was sent down to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam admonishing Abu Lahab because he had made a statement to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying Tabbal laka ya Muhammad destruction be upon you O Muhammad is this why you gathered us here to tell us that there is one God and what we are worshipping is wrong so Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said yes and indeed the people started scoffing and laughing at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but Allah revealed surat Abi Lahab where Allah says destruction be upon Abu Lahab, both of his hands be destroyed. So what happened is the little children of Makkah began to read these verses. They were so sweet in, in, in their poetic form. In fact, the Quranic form so sweet and so easy to memorize that the children who were running in the streets and the gullies of Makkah were busy saying Tabbat yada Abi Lahabin wa Tabba and it infuriated him so much that he told his son to release Ruqayya binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I don't want you to marry this woman anymore so they were engaged but that engagement was broken and when that happened Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam offering himself, asking for the hand of his daughter in marriage. And Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha was so happy. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was delighted and he got his daughter Ruqayya married to Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhuma. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon both of them. They were so happy as a married couple that the people used to actually give an example of them saying that we have not known a happier couple than Uthman and Ruqayya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all happy in our own marriages. Remember there is a great sacrifice. If you want your marriage to work, there is a sacrifice you need to make. It's not something that will just come like that. You don't just make dua, oh Allah, make us happy, make us happy. You spend no time at home. You make no effort to make your marriage work. It's not going to work. But if you make dua to Allah, oh Allah, make us happy and you're making an effort to be happy, to please Allah and so on, then by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the doors will open. So my brothers and sisters, this was the example of Uthman and Ruqayyah binti Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, at that particular time, because of what Abu Jahl was doing to the two of them, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave them permission to migrate to Abyssinia, to Africa. So the first family, the first couple to actually go from Mecca to Abyssinia was Uthman ibn Affan with his wife Ruqayya radiallahu anhuma. They had gone from Mecca to Abyssinia, but they did not last there very long because obviously the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the yearning of Uthman and his wife to be back with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to be a part of what was happening in Mecca. So after a short period of time, they came back and then they were from those who made hijrah to Medina Munawwara later on. Now, who were the friends of Uthman ibn Affan? It is important for us to know because with us, we also have friends that we keep and we maintain. So if you would like to be a successful person, your friends need to be people who are equally concerned about success. So who were his main friends? Number one, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. What a powerful friend. This is obviously over and above Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is the primary friend of all of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. But we're talking here of the others. So Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and Umar al-Farooq radiallahu anhum. These were the friends of Uthman ibn Affan primarily. And then the others, the noble from amongst the Muslimin, from amongst those who had accepted Islam from Quraysh, 
He befriended all of those and he took from them goodness. And he was always so humble, so humble as a human being that nobody would tell how wealthy he was. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. He was also a person who could read and write. So he was not an unlettered person as the norm was at the time. But he was one of the fortunate few who could read and write. And this is why if you recall at the time of the death of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he called Uthman ibn Affan and told him to write because Uthman could write. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. We can read and write, but do we use that ability to actually increase our knowledge of Allah and his messenger and to become closer to Allah? That's a question that I still have to answer. And so do you. And we will always have to answer this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold us responsible for the gifts that he has bestowed us with. So Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, the hero that we are speaking about today, he was a man who spent so much of his wealth that nobody could compete with him quantity wise. We spoke about percentage wise. Percentage wise, number one was Abu Bakr, as Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He gave 100% of what he had. But quantity wise, the rich man as Uthman ibn Affan, let's look at what happened during the Battle of Tabuk, just prior to the Battle of Tabuk. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a message to Mecca. And he got up on the mimbar in Medina Munawwara and he asked for donations towards the Battle of Tabuk. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum started coming with their various donations. And here comes Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. It is interesting how mention has been made of this in so many narrations. Some of them take the figure, bringing it as high as to a thousand animals that Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu brought. 950 camels all at once. Subhanallah. 950 camels and 50 horses. They say one third of the entire expense of that entire army was provided by one man. And his name was Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. As humble as he was, he did not speak unnecessarily. He was a quiet person. He was not one of the big lecturers. He had few words, but he was a humble man. So generous he was. On top of that, he brought 1,000 gold coins and placed them in the laps of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uthman ibn Affan. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was his son-in-law. His son-in-law. And he was so happy that he said, ما ضر عثمان ما فعل بعد اليوم. Nothing will harm Uthman from whatever he does after today. He will still have paradise. Subhanallah. So Uthman ibn Affan was told already that you will have paradise no matter what you do. But he was still a very humble person and he continued serving Islam and the Muslims. Our hero, Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us the, un the unity with these people, inshallah, in the Akhirah. My brothers and sisters, Uthman ibn Affan did not take part, did not take part in the battle of Badr from amongst the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. He was one of those who stayed behind upon the instruction of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? One might ask the most important battle was the battle of Badr. Those who took part in the battle of Badr were known as important people. They were known as people of paradise. Why didn't Uthman take part? Well, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, Oh Uthman, your wife is not well at all. And that was the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ruqayya binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She is not well at all. You take care of your wife. Don't worry. We will go out in the battle of Badr. So Uthman ibn Affan did not go with them. And when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came back from Badr, he found that his daughter had passed away. He found that his daughter had passed away. And Uthman ibn Affan was very, very sad. Not questioning the decree of Allah, but saddened because of the demise of his own wife, the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam considered him from amongst those who took part in the battle of Badr and granted him from the spoils. And his name was written as being from amongst those who took part in the battle. And on top of that, what we would term a cherry on the cake, was that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got him married to another daughter of his known as Ummu Kulthum binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is why Uthman ibn Affan, the only human being that we know of to be married to two daughters of a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No prophet before 
has had both daughters married to the same man one after the other subhanallah besides uthman and this was one of his virtues he was known as dhunnurain a person who owned two of the lights two noors what were these two noors ruqayya binti muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and umm kulthum binti muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam radiyallahu anhuma so he had both of those as wives this was Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, what a powerful man, what a powerful figure. Then we need to tell you of something else that happened to this man. Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, the wealthy businessman, the Sahabi, the very shy person, the man whom even the angels were shy of. When it came to a certain incident of water in Medina Munawwara, where they were being troubled, there was only one well in Medina that would have water throughout the years throughout the entire year. The other wells used to dry up and sometimes they had no water, sometimes they had water. So this well was known as Bi'ir Ruma, the well owned by a man known as Ruma. According to some narrations, Ruma was the name of the previous owner, but some narrations say it was just the name of the well. So it was called Bi'ir Ruma, not very far from where Masjid Al-Qiblatayn is today. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam encouraged the companions that look, we are being harassed by the owner of this well. He is charging so much money to the Muslims in order to take a bucket of water each. He would charge large amounts of money. So he, he is harassing us. Whoever buys this wealth, this well for him is paradise. Whoever buys this well for him is paradise. Here comes Uthman ibn Affan silently, quietly. He went to the owner and he told him, I want to buy the well. The owner says, I'm not selling the well. He says, okay, let me buy half of it. Look at how sharp a businessman he was. He said, okay, how much are you paying for it? They agreed on an amount. Some people say 20,000 dirhams. Some take it to 100,000. And some say that the man continued to increase until it went to a million. Only Allah knows the correct figure, but it was a large amount of money. So he said, okay, I buy half of it. We remain shareholders. One day we drink, one day you drink. He said, no problem. And the deal was struck, the money was paid. Now what happened is the Muslimin began to drink on the day of Uthman because Uthman made an announcement radiallahu anhu. He says, I have purchased 50% of this well and I have it one day and he has it one day. So you people can drink on my day for free, no money. So people used to come and they used to fill everything they needed and the next day no one was there. So the other man did not make any money anymore. So after some time, he decided to sell the other half as well. He says, no matter what I get, take it. Because obviously this was, uh, you know, a shrewd businessman who has outwitted me in business. He bought half not knowing that, you know what? You're going to lose all your business if this man gives it for free. I don't think they would have believed that someone would actually give this huge business deal out as an endowment for the Muslims as an endowment for the Muslims. Now I want to take you through what happened here. Uthman ibn Affan purchased this well. Now it is known as Bi'ir Uthman. The well of Uthman, the whole well belongs to Uthman. And he made it waqf, meaning endowed it for the Muslims. The surrounding land went with the well. The people now came every day and they drank. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the one who purchased the well for him is paradise. I want to tell you what happened. Today we are sitting in 2014 or 1435 Hijri. Today, there is a huge bank account by the name of Uthman ibn Affan in Saudi Arabia. And there are hotels that are built just near the Masjid al-Nabawi under the name of Uthman ibn Affan. The endowment gives back to the poor Muslims more than 50 million riyals a year. Today, I'm talking about today. Where did it start from? That well. The surrounding land started producing produce because the water was there. And what happened is the dates that came were all for the Muslimin. So the leaders of the Muslims over the years looked after it and made sure it was distributed and it went far and wide. And thereafter, it continued up to the recent times when there is a special ministry known as Ministry of Endowments which looks after the endowments of the Haramain, And one of them is this endowment of Uthman ibn Affan. Those dates, not only do they go across the globe, not only are those dates sold and the money goes back to the coffers of the Muslimin, 
and into that account known as Waqf of Uthman ibn Affan. But with that, they continued generating income generating product, uh, projects. And they have hotels and so many other things where the income goes to that particular endowment. Amazing. So up to this day, it is bearing fruit. This was the well of Uthman. And this is why Muhammad says, you buy this, for you is paradise. To this day, it is a sadaqatun jariya. It is something that continues. So when you go to Medina Munawwara, you need to know as you go to Masjid al Qiblatain, if it is on your left, on the right side, you will find an area, a beautiful posh area of Medina. Around there, you may ask the people, where is the well of Uthman? And perhaps you might go and see it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. Obviously, the virtue would only be that of understanding the value of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us to Medina in order to read Salah in Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us. Ameen. Another very interesting incident in the time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was during the Hudaybiyah, during the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, he was the one who was sent in from the outskirts of Mecca to speak to Quraysh. Do you know one of the reasons why? He was very closely related to them. So they wouldn't be able to harm him. He was very closely related to those people, to the leaders of Quraysh. So they sent Uthman. News came that they have killed Uthman. And this is when all the companions had pledged to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that even without weapons, we are going to fight Quraysh if they have killed Uthman ibn Affan. And this was known as Bay'atul Ridwan. This was known as the pledge where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala became pleased with those who were more than 1,300 companions who were ready to fight Quraysh because of the blood of Uthman ibn Affan. Just as well, rumor, it was just a rumor and it was clarified that he was not martyred. Another very interesting incident in the life of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. He was the one who extended Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi. He extended it so much. At the time of Umar, it was renovated. But at the time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an, it was extended a lot. He purchased some of the land nearby and he extended it and he made it up with brick and silver. This was Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi by Uthman ibn Affan. To this day, you find the door of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu an, in memory of this great Sahabi. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from him and may he use us to follow these footsteps. Uthman ibn Affan at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, Something interesting happened. This is a very touching story. Very touching. There came a year of drought where it was known as Amur Ramada. It was the time of Amir al Mu'minina Umar ibn al Khattabi radiallahu anhu. The drought was so severe that the people were hungry. They were, they were literally dying of hunger. And Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu anhu told him, Pray to Allah, pray for rain, and so on. That day, that day, People had heard that there is a great caravan of Uthman coming from the northern of part of the peninsula and it has in it a lot of food and a lot of uh, provision. And sometime later in the afternoon, a huge caravan consisting of 1000 camels pitched up into Medina Munawwara and it literally stopped at the door of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. A load of camels and the people had come out and they started helping getting the produce down and all the merchandise most of it was actually food stuff and Uthman ibn Affan emerged and the businessmen of Medina Munawwara who had the money they emerged and they said oh Uthman we want to buy from you the people are dying of hunger we want to buy from you from this food we will give you for every dirham that you spent two dirhams which means we give you 100% profit he said no I someone has offered me more so they said, okay, we give you more. He said, no, someone has offered me even more. So they said, okay, we will give you even more. And they continued. He said, sorry, someone has offered me more than whatever you people have offered. They said, it cannot be. We are the business people of Mecca, Medina Munawwara. We know we are the first to come to you. Who else has spoken to you? Nobody would be foolish to give you so much. He said, Allah has promised me that he will multiply it tenfold for me. They looked at him shocked. They said, what do you mean? He said, I make you witness that all these thousand camels you see here, 
I have donated them for the Muslimin. They can have them. I don't want a single dirham or dinar. This is between me and Allah. You people may have this. This was Uthman ibn Affan. 1,000 camel loads of food. And he just donated it just like that. Imagine containers of goods coming in. And you say, this is for fuqara al muslimin This is for the people who are needy. Whoever needs it, come and take from it. Don't worry. This is yours. This was Uthman ibn Affan, the great hero, the man who spent... Subhanallah. Later on, he took over after Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu as the leader. And this was also something very interesting. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu had appointed a group of men who were from amongst the remainder of the ten who Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said, you are from those who will earn paradise. So Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu was appointed from amongst them and allegiance was pledged for him. And they all pledged allegiance to him, including Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. He confirmed that Uthman is the leader. And everyone confirmed that Uthman is the leader. And Uthman ibn Affan, he was such a pious man. At his time, they say the people were good. Relations were good. Anyone who did not have, he provided for them. Sometimes with his own personal wealth, not necessarily the coffers of the Muslims. And so many countries had or so many different regions had now entered into the governorate of the Muslims from amongst them parts of Russia and Cyprus, Armenia and North Africa. So more and more areas of people had accepted Islam under the leadership of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. He was a person who had written the Quran or got it written in one dialect. Because at that time, as you know, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu had appointed Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu to gather the Quran. He gathered it and they gave a copy to Hafsa, who was the wife of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the daughter of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhuma. So what happened is, Uthman ibn Affan, he received a complaint from Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman that I've been to different areas and people are reading the Arabic language in a different dialect. So why don't we sort the problem out? So Uthman ibn Affan appointed Zayd ibn Thabit once again with him a few others and told them get the written parchments from Hafsa binti Umar radiallahu anha and write it down. We want it in one script. So they wrote it in one script. They got hold of all the others and they did away with them. And he sent a copy of this script to all the different parts of the Muslim lands. And he told them, this is now the final version. This is what you will follow. At that time, there were no dots. You know, you have two dots on top of the ta, two under the ya, one in the jim. No dots at all. It was just written. Their Arabic was so powerful, they knew how to read it. So what happened is it cut down the difference of opinion completely regarding the dialects in which the Quran should be read. To this day, we have the Quran that we have in our midst written in what is known as a Rasmul Uthmani, which means the writing that was confirmed by Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. This was one of the great achievements of Uthman ibn Affan. But people become jealous. When we achieve a lot, people become jealous. And there are others who had a bad eye. A man known as Abdullah ibn Saba al-Yahudi, he was actually a Jewish man from Sana'a, from Yemen. And he had started a major, he had started a major issue against Uthman ibn Affan, claiming that Uthman had appointed all his relatives as people who were the leaders of the various lands of the Muslims. Yet, those were appointed by Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu before Uthman. And Uthman had not even changed the bulk of them. But this was just a fitna. This was a way of instilling problem because the enemy of Islam saw that now the Muslims are growing. They have huge lands. The East and the West is all now turning to Islam. The best way to destroy the Muslims, internal conflict. So they started creating hatred against Uthman, saying that Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was supposed to be the leader. And yet Ali himself says, Uthman is my leader. Subhanallah. And after some time, they developed a great revolt against Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. But from amongst them, there was not a single Sahabi. And there was not a single child of any Sahabi. It was all people who had come later on. They were conned by this huge machine of propaganda that started off by Abdullah ibn Saba al-Yahudi. And what happened as a result, they murdered Uthman ibn Affan after surrounding him 40 days around his own home in Medina Munawwara. This was a powerful man. 
It is reported, and I'm going to end with this, that Uthman ibn Affan, the 40th day of being surrounded by these culprits in his home, they did not allow food or drink into his house, yet he was the one who did so much for the Muslims. They did not allow him to go to the masjid, yet he expanded the masjid. They did not allow him drink from the same well that belonged to him at one stage that he had endowed to the Muslims. So at the 40th day, he slept for a while and he saw a dream. In that dream, he saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhumah. And they told him, why don't you break your fast with us this evening? And on that Friday, he got up, he was fasting. That was the day. The, the opening of the fast, he did not see in this life. He was martyred before that. While his Quran was open, he was in his house. He was fasting. It was a Friday. And they came in and they brutally murdered him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the internal conflict amongst the Muslims. I would like to say, my brothers and sisters, be careful of those who instill hatred in you for your own brothers and sisters as Muslims. Be careful of them. This is the fitna that started at the time of Uthman ibn Affan. It continues to this day. People talk ill and evil about the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They talk ill and evil about the leaders of the Muslims and the ulama. And amongst us, they instill hatred. The result will only be fitna and further division. May Allah protect us all and grant us a great lesson from the life of this beautiful hero, Uthman ibn Affan. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and us all wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina muhammad subhanallah wa bihamdih subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk